you're just avoiding the pain and it's gonna grow it's gonna grow like if you imagine like a, a wound you know if you have break your arm and then you don't take care of it it's like dude your arm is gonna they're gonna have to re-break it five years later it's gonna hurt a million times worse and it may never be the same again yeah you know what i mean and people will avoid pain for years until you said 40 50 years old yeah. they'll avoid pain for so long to the point where they can't even come back from that because they can't even so much as look in a mirror that's yeah. why you hear like you see grown men crying getting yelled at it's because they've avoided pain for so long so even so much as me like yelling at you it's, it's painful to you so you got it you start crying because you you don't you don't even want to deal with that you know yeah. what i mean and it's like that's my biggest fear and, and what i don't understand is like once you are exposed to that at all you know and what i don't understand is people that can walk through their life with like living like that Another episode of Adversity Kings and another repeat offender. So obviously we've got Mr. Robert Jackson on. Is this your third episode? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three, yeah. three episodes. Yeah, it's going to be a little different though because uh, I'm actually going to be kind of interviewing you um, a lot. So, I mean, it's crazy because like you spend so much time with somebody like me and you, we spent five years together yeah. side by side, you know, every single day. I don't think there's been maybe a few days where we haven't seen each yeah. other. For five years i think i spent more time with you than we probably spent with our own families yeah and um and it's going to be a little different the reason i wanted to do this and kind of interview you was because you know i have been with you through five years i've watched you do personal development for five years and i want to be in a better position of leadership where i can help everybody else out there because i think you know where you come from is you're really really good at many things but you're like people always ask me like somebody said to me the other day they said you know and we'll get into this more in the podcast but they said you know uh you know i would love to be in tristan's position you know but i, I want to be more hands-on they're like I, I would i would want to be more hands-on like in the field like training people and i said listen bro i said you know i was like I, I, what you don't understand is tristan is more hands-on than probably anybody else in his business right but the difference is like if you and i said you'll see it when you become an mga right because you're so hands-on with the MGAs, with the QBs, but I was I would watch your messages, you know, every day. Like you get up, you'd pour into yourself, and then I know the messages are gonna start coming in of of where you're at, bro. And it's crazy because you're the way you lead vision in the culture and the organization and how you can bring people in the vision is like, you know, it's like it's just it's just crazy, bro. So I'm, we're gonna talk about it more in the podcast, but you'll see where I'm trying to get to in my point. But I want other people to understand and see this because I think if they don't get to experience this, and for people that don't get to see this in front of them in their face, I think they're missing out on a lot in their life. And I think yeah. a lot of people, if they just got around you and got to experience that, bro, I think that they would they would uh, it would completely change their mentality and their life and their mindset and everything that they do. So that's what we're going to get into on the podcast. But yeah, I'm going to be interviewing you a little bit. So yes, yeah, my third time on the podcast. What episode of Adversity Kings is this? Let me check Spotify to kind of give you the most accurate, accurate number here. Shoo-bee-dee-boo. This is 217 or 18. 218 yeah 200. so going through this podcast what i'm going to try to do is pull out of tristan basically the the biggest aspects of foundation and elements that you guys that are watching this um can take notes and actually implement yourself right that you guys can actually look at and be like all right this is what he does this is how he thinks and this is how he operates because you notice the biggest determining factor between successful and unsuccessful people in every area of their life is just the way that they think so when you were preaching out there today, you were talking about everything and I was just listening and I was like, dude, like it's just insane. You said you're part-timing in your life. And I think that's the biggest thing is there's there's no middle class in life. You know, you're either complete poverty or you're complete wealth in every area of your life. Mindset, you know, spirit, all the, all the nine yards. So jumping into it, bro, I just want to talk to you about five years. So obviously, you know, you just posted that throwback picture on your story of you from what, three, four years ago in Nebraska. Yeah. And uh, you just look completely different, right? Yeah. And that's how it should be. You know, if you look different a couple years from now physically, that's how you know you're pouring into yourself correctly when you look different as well. That's something that you can't fake. But what day one coming into the business, right? Obviously, you did some personal development before the business. But like even back to day one, when you would come into the business and you were nobody knew your name, you weren't anything special. You're just some normal guy that came into business and you had to prove yourself 
you know, you talked about how you would be up at seven in the morning at the office and you would be reading a book yeah. and then listening to a podcast at the same exact time. Dude, let's see if Brody answers because, uh, you know, he pulled up on me a few times when that was occurring and he would be like, you're not even learning nothing, dude. Shut that shit off. <laughs> yeah, because how can you read and listen yeah, to a podcast at I the still, same time? I, I've minimized it because I think I was reading, listening and watching. I don't, I don't know what all was going on. Let's let's see if he answers. The eclipse is going on right now, so everybody's a- out acting acting crazy. We'll see if he answers here, but this is this is the gentleman that actually taught me everything in the insurance game. Um, he just ordered that new Lambo, right? The ordered re- the new Lambo. Revolto or whatever? Yeah, he's got the McLaren, what, 720S right now, the Porsche. and Yeah, Porsche, the GT2 G-Wagon. RS. G-Wagon, yep. All types, all types of things going on. But, yeah, Brody could attest to it. Yeah, he doesn't answer his phone, but he could attest. If you guys ever want to fact check rob on that yeah 7 a.m pull up and you know oftentimes i'd be sitting there reading and waiting for the office to get unlocked and i'd be i'd be reading a book and listening to an audio book so so why is that though bro like how 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 did you know all right coming into because like when i came in this business i had nothing yeah i've never even so much as been exposed to the world of self-development personal development or you know, I didn't know what factor that even played in your life. Obviously, I wanted to be in good shape. I wanted to go to the gym. I wanted to be close to God, and I wanted to increase my intelligence and my knowledge. But, you know, I was not exposed to the world of self-development, the world of in- investing, you know, back into your business or any of that. I thought $1,000 was a lot of money growing up. And, you know, you come in this business, and you immediately are start pouring in and developing and leveling yourself up as a person. Like, where did you get that from, and how did you know that that was going to be the path that you would walk over the next five, six years to get where you're at now? So I think everything initially, especially when you're you're transitioning from that teenage age into that adulthood, if you're measuring it off of human metrics of how we measure our age, you're 18 to 19 to 20. So I, I believe all of that is determined by the preceding seeds of your adolescent years. You know what I mean? So all of the things that occurred to me when I was a child from mom and dad and the things they instilled into me, I believe those seeds took fruit and they, and then they took roots first prior to the fruits. Probably I'd say around 10 or 11 years old when my dad started working me out every night, you know what I mean? So instead of, you know, spankings that we, we evolved into working out, you know? So if, if, if there was any type of, repercussions needed, bad grades, anything, you would work out, and then you would explain, you know, why you're working out, and everything like that. And so that was pretty much instilled from a young age. Even even eat dessert. Like you you could have all the dessert you want, but you're gonna work out. And so and same deal with my mom, you know, it's anything that you're gonna start, you're gonna finish. But all of those little details that they consistently and habitually implemented into my early childhood and those fundamental ages, that developed and essentially it took root and then it started to produce those fruits. 17, 18, 19 years old when I started to really develop myself and then I attached that to an opportunity and then that translated into money. So all that development was already, those were seeds that were planted a decade prior, you know, and they and they came to fruition. Everything I believe in this world operates in, in years at a minimum. Anything good is, is, I believe, a couple years is the price, you know what I mean? From seeds planting, nourishment, working your soil, and all of these are analogies in regard to self-development. So. You can you can very easily tell where a man or a woman's going just just by simply analyzing the the seeds that they're planting today. You know what I mean? You can kind of give them an idea. Three, six, nine, you know, twelve years from now, here's where you're gonna be. I, I'm really caught up on like a three year, you know, evolution. Every three years, I believe you're evolving into an either worse person or a better person. Everybody's constantly evolving. There's no choice for you not to evolve. The only choice is for you to evolve physically, mentally, spiritually, and you're either doing it better or you're doing it worse. And then the only other option is death. So all of those things were instilled from a young age. So what about individuals like, you know, for me, like obviously my dad would, um, you know, he always gave me great advice, like when I would meet with him and a lot of the things he said that I got from, you know, I would hear you say, or Simon would say from what I would remember hearing from him. And, um, but like, I never really had, you know, even, even close to that, you know, I grew up, my mom kind of did, you know, spoil us to a way, like we had everything we ever needed. You know what I'm saying? I never really had to struggle too crazy for a lot of stuff. We didn't have like a lot of money, but she always made sure everything looked fine and everything was cool. So I didn't get exposed to, you know, the adversities of, of life really until after I joined this business. But what about people for me, for example, 
you know, when I was growing up and I was around everybody else that was mediocre, average, broke, living mundane life that I didn't want to live and I just felt uncomfortable in, intrinsically. But then I saw Grant Cardone and then I saw and met you yeah. and I saw this company and I didn't care about the money. I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to be, I wanted to have the same mentality that you had. I wanted to have, you know, the, the way that you carried yourself. I wanted that, bro. I wanted to change my identity completely into somebody like that, a CEO, more professional, an individual that people would look at and just, you know, growth was more impressive than anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when I came home after, you know, a couple of years in the business, barely seeing my mom and she was, she didn't care about how much money I'd made. I made a lot of money, but she was like, she was more impressed with the growth that I had. So what do you think it is that the difference is for people that born into an average environment, mediocre environment, based on all everything that they've been through, they should end up like this because yeah. of their environment. But they decide to go on a different path, level themselves up, change themselves forever and, and kind of become that iconic uh, inspiration for other people. You know, how do people defer from that growing up in an average environment, but they're just naturally attracted to that that life, that level of self-development of bettering yourself and, and you know, taking care of your family for generations to come. How do you think somebody transitions from, okay, follow the path of my family of being average or go out and do something that's above average and, and kind of change the world? What do you think, this, how does that even happen intrinsically in somebody? Everybody's brain wakes up one day. Your brain just wakes up, you know what I mean? And unfortunately that, that day usually comes 30, 40, 50 years old. And it's not that people are out of time, but they're so paralyzed and they're so just fearful that they've lived half of their lives unawake, just in a sleep, in a paralysis mode, just not, not, not realizing essentially the matrix that everything they've done up until that point is almost worthless. Like they've just been playing this character society wanted them to play some type of sheep. And I spoke on this earlier today. And so when you have that brain awakening moment, that's when life truly begins. You can't control where you're born, but you do control where you die. So I don't care if you're in another country, if we logically and statistically break that down, yes, anybody not in America, pretty much 99% of the time is at a disadvantage. So I don't believe in a disadvantage nor a struggle in America. It's a blessing for us to have access to America. If we're already across American borders and you're within you know, the, the American borders, you've already got an advantage. Because I used to believe, you know, growing up with both parents going away and mom getting out and raising us on food stamps, I used to think we had the worst story in the world until I went on a missions trip at 16 with a Christian academy that I was attending at the time. And we went to Peru and we traveled through the mountains and we saw these individuals living in mud huts and we preached to them and we broke bread with them and we fed them and prayed with them. And I realized at that point, and I didn't stop speaking about poverty until true and truly embracing it, probably until a couple of years ago in regard to how I grew up, because it took 10 years for it to truly settle into my soul and realize how you grow up in America is very different, you know what I mean, from household to household. 80 to 90% are just mediocre, you know what I mean, whatsoever. Everybody's living check to check. 20% are not. But regardless, a check to check household in America is a thousand times better than living in a mud hut with no access to running water, to medicine, to a proper education. There's access to nothing, but you'll still find individuals just a diamond in the rough that'll find them themselves awakening. And what you said here is what the entire world misses out on because very rarely will you find an individual, like you mentioned, you grew up in a mediocre household and maybe not too much or there wasn't many individuals that you had around you that showed you a life that you wanted. But then you said you came across a gentleman named Grant Cardone. So when you have exposure, you have contamination. The law of exposure, yes, sir. The law sir. of exposure, exactly. So most people don't realize that because everybody's so exposed so frequently to so much mediocrity, when you have consistent exposure, what does your body do? When you're consistently exposed to a virus, when you're consistently exposed to some type of germ, your body eventually over time, it might get sick the first few times, but eventually what happens? Yeah, it adapts to it. Yeah, it you beats adapt. it, yeah. So adaptability, they'll say, is the key to success, but it's also the key to failure. So it's the consciousness of your adaptability. When you realize you're adapting in the wrong directions and you start to become awake, and that's how I like to call it just an awakening moment. When your brain awakens, 
people call it a spiritual awakening, finding Jesus, finding Allah, whatever you believe in. But if you just look at it and just simplify it where a toddler could watch this and understand, okay, eventually I'm going to have an awakening. Hey, I'm doing a podcast. What's up? Okay. All right, good. That's better. All right, brother. Bye. So that awakening moment, that's, that's pretty much the predetermining factor of where you're going to be in life. And I think the biggest thing is when you're consistently exposed to an environment, most individuals build up an endurance to the environment they're exposed to. And so since so many people are exposed to mediocrity, we live in a world that condones sleeping in, comfort. You don't need to work out. You can just do biking or something. You know what I mean? Like CrossFit or something. Cro like, and even that is, is probably way more physically active and involved from my, my perspective than, you know, some of these people are suggesting, like, I have no idea. Like, when you look at the, you uh, what is it, the FDA? Is that the Federal Drug Administration? When they come, come together with the new food charts and they tell you Lucky Charms, is more nourishing than a steak. And so you've, you've got this, this small group, this minority of evil people that program the majority, but because they're consistently exposed to a poverty mindset, and that isn't a representation of material, it's more so a representation of your internal, of how you perceive things when it comes to self-development, mentally, working out, praying, and spiritual development, and then financial development, None of these people have literacy in any of these categories because the world tells you consistently, be average, be comfortable, don't worry about that stuff. And it consistently has weakened the world. But then when you have an individual that steps out and gets exposed to the minority, it's just like when this, when this country was discovered. When a human being identifies something they're not familiar with, their initial response is fear. So when they came to America, from all of the his history that I've read and studied, when we discovered America, we feared the Native Americans. They didn't look like us, they didn't talk like us, they didn't walk like us, nor did they hunt, speak. Not, not, nothing they did was like us. Same deal with Africans. When we started to bring Africans to America, and then there's that lack of familiarity. Even now, if I go into a very predominantly white place, I'll still see a, like a, just a look or a glance, you know what I mean? And, and it doesn't even have to be skin, you know what I mean? People, people pick up on different cues of like, you and I walk into a room like many times we have before of very older individuals that are very wealthy and we move the same, we talk the same, we operate the same, we're making the same if not more, but they're still judging based off of age and so people fear what they're not familiar with. And so when a sheep steps out to become a lion, all the sheep want to start attacking it and bringing it back down to their level of function functionality. They function at a low level. So they want to, it's like the crab effect. Like every like, yeah, everybody crawling out the bucket. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So all of these individuals is like, start waking up early, but then all the loser crabs pull you back down. Start reading yourself. All the loser crabs, don't ever read. Just eat gummies and play 2K or you know, play Madden all day or something. Like, don't ever worry about that. You know what I mean? Because they'll, they'll, they'll justify it and complain and blame and defend and say, well, I know a rich person or I know somebody that does this and got the result without doing it. And they'll come up with these weak, sheepish justifications. But it all roots and stems back to ego. I found everything stems back to ego. And the underlying foundation of ego is just insecurity. Somebody hurt you or you were hurt through your awakening of thinking this person was against you, the situation was against you, and so now that pain, when, when you hold on to pain, it evolves into ego. What I've realized as I've gotten older is if you leave pain, you also create more opportunity for humility and confidence to absorb and, and satiate and saturate your entire being because now if I have no pain, I have no opportunity for me to respond with an internal anger. With no internal anger, I have no ability for my confidence to to essentially just f basically transform from the confidence into this evil confidence which we describe as ego but it all roots back to well you were just picked on as a kid or your parents weren't there for you 
or you were mad because your boyfriend broke up with you, your girlfriend broke up with you, somebody called you some name when you were growing up from the way you looked, you, you spoke, the way you you know acted in school, whatever it might be, and it all roots back to all of these areas, but it, it all stems into two or three areas, fear, familiarity, ego, and then that's how you can start to group out and, and make sense why the world operates the way it does, because if you step out, people will lack familiarity with you, it will increase fear in them, and when people are fearful, they attack. And so they'll attack you and tell you you're doing the wrong things. You spend too much money. You shouldn't go into business debt. Why are you in debt? And then when you show them Dana White and you say, do you like this guy? I love Dana White. I love UFC. Well, did you know he was $40 million in debt when he hired Joe Rogan? That means he spent even more money in the midst of his debt. Do you like, do you like this guy? You show him Jeff Bezos. Would you trade lives with him? Did you know he spent all of his money, he spent all of the business revenue for 20 years, essentially taking minimal profit percentages just to get by, just so he could beat his competition in the long run? He started in his garage. Elon Musk still stays in his house, or stays, stays in his offices at times. He leverages so much capital from other different businesses, you know, essentially fluctuating on, on zero liquid, I would imagine, at certain times. So it's like, then you start to show these people these things, and then you show them the behind the scenes. And they're like, oh no, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm familiar with that. And so now their response is fear. Because it sounds good when they put it on their Instagram, but then when it's time to live it, oh no, I wish they were more hands-on. I was so worried when you were like, you were like, um, <laughs> you do many things good. And then someone was asking me and I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, somebody asked them, what, the, what good things does Tristan do? <laughs> What's Tristan good at? I was like, oh shit. <laughs> well, no, I told him it's in the cut because it's a Pareto principle. You know, you spend, you know, like you, for example, you just answered that phone call and people probably thinking like, why is he answer a phone call in the middle of a podcast? Like he doesn't respect. It's like, who called you it was Justin, right? Yeah. And Justin, who contributes, you know, well over 50 to 60% of the organization yeah. that, to the agency is, you know, one, one of your right hand, left but, hand man. But like remove, your... remove Justin from the equation. When I was physically training you in the field for the people, I hope they watch this, that, that uh, don't have the hands on training from me. What did I do in every presentation if the phone rang? What do you if, mean? If my phone rang, what did I do in the middle of the presentation? Oh, yeah, you answered the phone. I answered it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe when you answer a call in the middle of a presentation, depending on your delivery, when you end the call or in the midst of the call, hey, look, sir, or ma'am, I apologize, I got to take this call. Very important. I got a bunch of different you know, individuals yeah. to get out to today. I got this is one of my trainees. It just builds up your level of importance. 100%. You know what I mean? From when I've studied Andrew Tate, I've studied this past year Dan Bozerian, the people that are very, very much desired appear desirable. Yeah. So wherever you're at, if you can increase your appearance of desirability, now you also increase your persuasion simultaneously. A lot of people don't realize there's a lot of people that walk this earth and don't need to say anything to close you. Yep. They just appear very desirable. 100%. I mean, it's like, what would you rather work with? A guy that has nothing on his schedule and he's not getting anything done? Yeah. Or especially when you're trusting somebody with money, like in our business, it's yes. like, I'd 100% rather work with a guy that everybody trusts with his money than someone that doesn't. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's 100%. But what you were just talking about with that was like, for example, you say, you know, fear and it brings pain out of people. And I think you said pain was a great teacher. And that's the biggest thing. And I heard from you before is like, you know, eventually you get to a point where you go through your whole life avoiding pain, right? Yes. And it's kind of like the gym. Like there's a TV show where, you know, it's called fat to fit to, or fit to fat to fit, right? Yeah. It's where the, the trainers will get fat with the client and then yeah. they'll get back to fit. And when they get fat, they realize, you know, how much harder it is to work out being fat. You yeah. see what I'm saying? And so it's the same thing with people internally, mentally and physically and spiritually with their pain is a lot of times they can't, they get to a point where they can't even look in the mirror anymore yeah. because you look in the mirror and it's so much pain. Yes. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, you can withstand pain, but pain can do a, a degree. It could kill you. That's you know an easy I mean? way also that you bring up. That's an easy way to stay in shape. It's just when you're in your own space or wherever you're allowed to be, just constantly have your shirt off. Yeah. Because you got to constantly look at yourself. You know yeah. what I mean? So like, I'm, I know like I'm, I'm looking good when I constantly have my shirt off because like I'm comfortable in any position. You know what I mean? So if you constantly have your shirt off, it's going to force you 100%. to accept what you've got underneath that shirt. Yeah, and people people look at it like, you know, people like, oh, I don't want to get too big. It's like, man, it's like you're just avoiding the pain and it's going to grow. It's going to grow. Like if you imagine like a, a wound, you know, if you have break your arm and then you don't take care of it, it's like, dude, your arm is going to, they're going to have to re-break it 
five years later, it's going to hurt a million times worse and it may never be the same again. Yeah. You know what I mean? And people will avoid pain for years until you said 40, 50 years old. Yeah. They'll avoid pain for so long to the point where they can't even come back from that because they can't even so much as look in the mirror. That's yeah. why you hear like you see grown men crying, getting yelled at. It's because they've avoided pain for so long. So even so much as me like yelling at you, it's, it's painful to you. So you got You start crying because you, you don't you don't even want to deal with that. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's like, that's my biggest fear. And, and what I don't understand is like, once you are exposed to that at all, you know, and what I don't understand is people that can walk through their life with like living like that, you know what I mean? Living yeah. like that. You have to like, in the back of my head, I, I always say that, that to myself, like you are your greatest asset, right? So like, regardless of who works at this company, regardless of, you know, in five, 10 years, who's here, I could leave, everybody else could leave, whatever. The company's still going to be doing a lot of, money and a lot of numbers just because of you just because assignment just because of the leaders in the company the value that you guys bring is going to attract those type of people in yeah. the first place and that's what i tell everybody is like you are you know whether you're born a level one or a two you know if you measure yourself on a grade of one to ten as you're born yeah. right you can level yourself up to become as close to a level 10 but what you seem to forget is that you attract whatever you are in life yeah so if you're a level three you're going to only attract level three people level three women and level three uh, money. You know yes. what I mean? And it's like, you know, and you look at the problems I want, like everybody should look at the problems that they went through in their life and look at the conflicts they face and they problem. They can say, yeah, life, you know, life, life is coming down on me or life's hard on me or whatever. But it's at the end of the day, it's like, if you really like did self like assessment and, and self-reflection to yourself, you would realize that you've been creating problems instead of solving them. You've been creating your own problems because of your lack of development of yourself. You've been attracting level three people into your life, which those are the same people that would steal money from you, backstab you, level three women that would be disloyal to you, level three business partners that would, you know, screw you out of money. And it's like, nobody wants to be around a level three. That's just what it is. People don't want to be around a level, a level three. That's just, that's just it. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's like, so I can sit here and cry about life coming down on me, but it's like, if I would have done the self-development on myself and done the right things and thought the right way through growing my intelligence and growing my beliefs, growing my mental and learning from you and, and, and following and doing what you do and leveling myself up. If I was a level eight, I wouldn't be attracting level, you know, level three people into my life. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a level eight, nine or 10, the money that's going to be coming in is going to be legal, good God given money. So God given money lasts a long time. Yeah. You know, quick, evil, satanic money, it goes away quickly. You know, whether that's through the instances of, you know, gambling or wrongdoings or whatever the case may be, that money goes quickly. You know what I mean? That's why, like you said today, lottery winners, they lose it. Yeah. God, give, you're going to attract God given money, God given people that have great characters, morals, and values, right? So you attract people that in, in a different room, no matter how much money's on the table, they're not going to stab you in the back. You attract level eight, nine, 10 women that are going to take your teachings as a man raise your kids the right way and to learn what's best for them in life. You know, and I think that uh, especially for those people that do believe spiritually in something, whether that's God or anything, you know, he put us on this earth to create the best version of ourselves because if you are an asset, if you're the best version of yourself, then you're showing up to your family, to your mother, right? And your mother looks at you and she sees that you grew yourself. You're just going to give your greatest self to your people, to your mother, so you're doing everybody a favor by developing yourself because when you show up, you're helping them. And positivity yeah. attracts and elevates people more than anything. You know, so I think it's like what I what I try to figure out, and I asked you this before, is for people that, you know, a lot of people learn the hard way or the harder way, right? Yeah. You have to hit rock bottom to level up a lot of people. So for you, it's like, number one, how do you almost not prevent people from hitting rock bottom, but how do you get people that do hit rock bottom to not be become a victim and a crybaby of like, oh, this is all happening to me. But you get them to say, all right, I'm back at the bottom. I created this problem. How do I use this problem to level up? Because, you know, Simon, you said it, adversity causes people to break records. Some men to break and some men to break records. Yeah. So what is the separating factor between people that break records, people that break, and people that, like you, who are just driven on self-development. No matter what happens, you're going to keep developing yourself. You're going to keep growing yourself. And eventually, when you look five, 10 years from now, I mean, you're already on the way up there right now. You're about to meet with Andy Elliott, Daniel G, did a podcast with Wes Watson. Your influence is growing. You're talking to 
you're talking to multimillionaires reaching billionaire level, growing your influence, and you're starting to get recognized almost on a global level where you're going to be one of those iconic individuals that people are like, dude, that's, that's Tristan Delabic. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? So how do you think, what, what do you think like really separates the person from, you know, one in a million, you could say like yourself versus somebody that sees you and understands that that's, that's available, to, but they don't, they don't take that path. Yeah. So I, th I think the separator one, one, you have to accept that we're dealing with an odds of one out of a hundred people. We're, de we're dealing with a category of 1%, but that's still a significant amount of people, especially, especially if you're just looking at it from a perspective of America, there's 400 million people here. Let's just say, I think there's 330 million, but I just figured with the way the border's working right now, we could just add 70 million, you know, so <laughs> say 70 million. 400 million people here. So what's 10% of 400 million, 40 million? And so if you've got 40 million and you take 10% of that, 4 million, there's 4 million people in America right now that, that should be operating in, in a 1% type of manner. So I would still say that's a, that's a lot of people. And I think everybody watching this has an opportunity to be one of those people. But I, I, first, first off, I believe you only break to the level of brokenness within and you heal that over time. You're always going to break. There's always gonna be seasons of breaking, but it should, the, the, the rock bottom now, if you're five years into your journey, should be five, like it should be five levels higher. It should be five years of development higher, and then you get knocked back down. Essentially how a video game will auto save your, your last spawn or whatever, like that's, that's how life should work, is you, you should only break to the level of your brokenness. And so I think people, and I believe I was watching a clip on Elon Musk the other day, is our minds are constantly recalibrating and it's essentially a human weakness because we always, we constantly forget how far we've come just as a society and as a species and not realizing that a couple grandfathers ago, our greatest worries and concerns were just living past 50 years old. You know, now we have access to medicine and just a way of life and everybody in America essentially has running water, power, and technology pretty much at, at their fingertips, at their disposal. When you take into consideration the power of the mind, you realize most people aren't breaking from an external event. They're breaking from an internal event. And so really the root of this and the answer and the solution to this will always revert back to the simplicity of you break to the level of your brokenness and then you rise to the level of your internal healing. And you can only heal yourself through consistent development. So I always look at myself as a, as a medical patient, and my responsibility today is to heal a little more. And there is, no, there is no destination. You will always be broken, you will always be sick, and you will always need healing. And the only one that can provide you medicine is yourself through faith. So now taking that, when you take that instruction and, and you convert that into application, you know, taking 1% instruction to 100% application will always be better than 100% instruction and 1% application. So I'm always trying to apply and implement with consistency and patience the healing that I need, my soul needs. More importantly, yes, yeah, show up for everybody in your circle, your friends, your family, your future, but you deserve it. The people watching it right now, you deserve a better life right now. And so if there's somebody to show up for, you show up for you. And then you show up for the rest. Well, you, um, one thing I always realized about you since I met you and was, was my biggest struggle when I started was self-belief, self-confidence and self-belief, right? Yes. And I was under the impression when I started that people were born with it and that you either had it, you didn't have it. You know yeah. what I mean? As I started to get further into it, I realized that it was created, you know, self-confidence and self-belief through the development of yourself, obviously. And, you know, Marcus Smith said this in one of his videos that you talked about, like belief is the biggest thing. You yes. have to have the belief in yourself and a belief in what you do, because if you don't believe that you're the best, then how will you ever believe that you deserve to be on that stage and accept a first place award if you don't believe you deserve the win? Yes. And the work comes before the belief, obviously, the work on yourself and then the worth work on your on your business and on your development. So when you. When, you, when I first met you and I saw the self-confidence that you had and the self-belief and determination that you had is what really attracted me. 
And for those of you guys that are listening that, you know, you might be, you know, struggling with it or putting on that fake, that fake confidence or that fake belief or whatever, you know, how, if someone were to cultivate the confidence, the confidence, the self-belief in themselves, obviously you had it through, yes, personal development, but also through hard times. What do you think somebody listening right now that could go through they're 16, 17, 18 years old, whatever, and they're on a journey as an entrepreneur or whatever they decide to do. How do you think they could get to where you're at quicker developing themselves, but without having to go through as much as you went through, without having to learn through failure, learn through adversity? How do you think someone can can level themselves up through through that way? And That's the greatest that? way to learn. You know, I think as entrepreneurs and individuals that kind of, when, when you get <laughs> There's no other way to say it. When you get sucked into the sales culture full of Kool-Aid of sales culty sayings and quotes and captions and reposts, you'll have another mental awakening and you'll realize all of these deceptive tactics to keep, you know, sales hamsters just running on their sales wheel with trophies and titles and all of these different things, you, you start to realize that all of that is meaningless if there's no internal growth. And that growth and what you'll find in that sales Kool-Aid culture is a lot of us will hype up an extreme amount of hard work and adversity. And this is logical and this is extremely valuable because I do believe at the 1% level, everybody's smart, everybody's a great marketer. It's the hard worker, I believe that's the variable that separates. It's the individual that is adaptable and has durability to endure through the adversity. But then I think of another piece in that 1%, that 0.25%. And these individuals study and apply. And so if you're listening to this, you can study from the mistakes of others. And you can only do this if you consistently absorb history. I've, I found myself becoming more and more fascinated with history, studying presidents, studying leaders, studying dictators, evil, positive, any type of leadership on a global level, because I believe you can only grow to the level that you acquire and study internally. You know what I mean? So it's like if I sent you across the country right now with no address and no direction. You wouldn't end up anywhere. You know what I mean? It would take you years to figure out how to get across the country as it would me. And so how can you say you would wish to be a great leader if you have no idea of even where the destination is supposed to be? And so the separator here for the individuals that truly want to implement intelligence, what I call is entrepreneurial intelligence. This doesn't mean you're going to go out and build a rocket ship because you and I are very similar. I barely have you know, anything above an eighth grade education if you consider the actual technicality of, of studying in school. You know, I pretty much gave up on school and then expelled my sophomore year. But look at it this way. If there's two groups of people building houses and they, they're both instructed to build houses and they both, they both have access to this new information. We're going to build these houses and the information within the pamphlet is Here's machinery that you'll have access to. It will expedite the process and minimize any type of liability and pain in the process of you building as many houses as possible. The first group says, we're hard workers. We've done this before. Just go get your shovels. Go get the concrete. Get your gloves. We'll pop out houses because we're right. hard workers and we've endured through adversity and you know we've developed ourselves and you know we're the chief administration officer of, of the the freaking laundry, you know what I mean? Just some stupid title with stupid trophies and all this stupidity. The second group says, hey, it doesn't take a genius for us to figure out there's a workbook here, let's flip through it. They may even read half of it. And if they implement 100% of this educational, proven workbook on how to build these houses and the access to the machinery and to do this on an expedited level, now you've saved yourself 10 years or they've saved themselves millions of dollars in equation equating that to time and it's like when you save time you make money but in addition to that when you save time you create more time for you to become a more valuable individual which i believe that's the invaluable exchange there 
is when you can figure from another individual, another process, another system, that's the only point to truly study and read and learn is how can I save time so I can convert this into more time that I can cherish as I'm a more enlightened being. I, I, I really don't, I, I don't see why people make it very complex. You know what I mean? Like it's very simple. You know, we should stop, we should stop with the nonsense of who can go through, who, like it's, it's this, it's like this measuring swords contest. You know what I mean? Like who can go through the most adversity and who can go through the most setbacks and fall on their face the most. Like you'll get around salespeople. It's usually the sales culture. You know what I mean? When you get around really, really rich people, it, the, the goal here is to avoid mistakes. When you get around poor rich people, their goal is to like, m like rack up mistakes. Yeah. You'll go to a big sales con like convention and they'll be like, how broke did you go this year? Went broke again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what happened to you this year? Lost everything. <laughs> I had to reset my whole life. You know what I mean? Like, they have, like, this contest. Like, you didn't quit, though. Like, dude, you, you've been running in circles for the last two or three years, and you're not even analyzing that the root problem here is your, is your self-development or your leadership development. There's just, like, a root problem that's very easily identifiable, but people, again, they get sucked into this, like, ideology. There's levels of mediocrity and I don't think people realize we're at a, a massive level of mediocrity right now at the million dollar range. People making about a hundred thousand to a million dollars are in this, it's mainly sales people and what I'm seeing because usually if you're really crushing entrepreneurship you're making two, three, four, five million plus and you, you've got a different perspective on life but these sales uh, people in between that hundred thousand to a million they get sucked into this loophole mindset of this ideology of, of You'll find sales guys getting stuck in a trophy mindset. They're going to run and chase trophies for 10 years and, and not realize they're not getting any better. You know what I mean? They're just stacking up stupid desk plaques. Then you got your guys that chase titles and they don't realize they've got the best title in the world. You know what I mean? Like chief hot dog officer. And it says a thousand percent on their contract. You have a thousand percent, you know, commission and bonus. And then they make two sales a year. It's like, no wonder you don't get paid. Yeah. But then you've got the third individual. And they're going to go, if not now, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually they're going to make millions of dollars and they're going to break from the cycle because they realize it's not the titles, it's not the trophies, it's not even the money today. It's the consistent habitual development and just the consciousness, awareness. Your, your mind is a report card and it's constantly giving you a grade with every breath you take. You made a good decision. That's an A. You made an okay decision. That's a B. You've made a very dumb decision, Tristan. That is a D. And now you've gained five pounds from that, or you've lost $50,000 from this, or you've damaged this relationship, and that will cost you five years of mending, and it will never be forgotten. So people don't realize you've got the best money printer right here with the smartest computer in the entire world our brains yes and so it's like that's what i'm really praying for right now is uh you know i've been i'm we're in the sales culture and what i'm realizing is i'm starting to elevate my mind humbly before god that there's a lot of people that we can save in the sales culture that are just they've tapped out because they got burned out in tracing chasing titles and trophies and they forgot the whole reason they got into sales. They were most people were like, ah, I want to get rich. Yeah, you wanted to get rich, but you like you like the byproduct. But everybody buys the product. The product was the person. You like the way they spoke, the way they yep. moved, the finesse, the swagger, the confidence, the power, the recognition. And then that is a byproduct of the real product, which is the inner core of that being that spent 10 years developing themselves. So that's why when people are like, you guys are just selling courses and development, it's MLM, it's like Everybody you look up to has poured into themselves for decades, for years. And that's the breakthrough because, and there won't ever be a breakthrough. As much as I'll pray for it and bring attention to it, the reason being is, in a message I gave a while ago was, you know, I was studying the King of David and David was anointed at 12 or 13 years old to that he was gonna be the king of the chosen land. I believe it was Israel at the time. So. In that anointing phase, he was also selected to fight Goliath, and he defeated Goliath. And the, the Bible spends a good amount talking about him defeating Goliath. But people don't realize he fought a way bigger Goliath. That Goliath was just to appease mere men. 
that would hear the story and, and be excited about their little battles they face every single day. But nobody, nobody realizes the war of Goliath that David faced himself in isolation, anointed to be a king at 13 years old, but not stepping into his throne until 30. Let's say 15 to make it easy. Could you wait 15 years before you got your throne? Before you got your blessing? Before you got your answer? Before you got the money? 15 years of you working in the field, tending to sheep, tending to low level physical things, but consistently doing the internal daily habits of development. He worshiped, he prayed, he worked out, he developed and poured into himself, and it wasn't overnight. The blessing and the anointing was delivered in a verbal promise. It didn't physically manifest until 15 years later. So the Goliath that he faced, that giant, that was just a, let me appease my children as they read this story and they think about that's the Goliath. The Goliath doesn't kill you. I know many men and many women that beat giants daily. I know very few that can beat the giant of time. Time has killed more men and more women than anybody else. How many of you can sit there and wait? And a lot of people wait. I should say this. How many of you can work and wait? Show up and do the same thing again and again and again. And not grow fatigued, but grow fanatic, obsessed, possessed. Like everything inside of you is consumed with the idea of, I will take over this world and I will do it with you or I will do it through you. It's your choice. Every thought, every thought. And you talked about that because what you got, what I was uh, thinking about when I was listening to you was, you know, like people would, people would come to me, it goes back to what you said, and they would say, you know, how did you get so good at sales? And you said your brain and the computer. And that's what it is, is because when you become completely obsessed with something so much that even every thought that crosses your mind is, is about that, yes. about that thing, about becoming that person or about, you know, developing yourself. And you talked about, and people would be like, well, how'd you become so good at sales? And they're like, what's the best way to learn sales? Well, every presentation that you would do and you would, you know, you would sell them or you wouldn't sell them. Yeah. And you would say, all right, this is where you could feel when someone, you have someone's attention. You know, this is where I had their attention. This is where I provided value. This is what I did good. This is where they bought. And then this is where they, they didn't. This is where I lost them. You know, so you kept the good and spit out the bad, right? So you just do mental construction on yourself through, through daily. But you said the Goliath and waiting and doing the work. And I think that's the biggest thing that, that people fall sight of. And I fell sight of it before where, you know, it's the, the greatest people on earth just do the basics very well. Yes. And the basics of the, developing yourself. So me asking you, you know, what, and that's the, that's the journey. Obviously the journey didn't start with you obsessed. You didn't have thoughts in your brain of like, uh, like completely obsessed with, you know, to the point where we don't even so much as follow people on Instagram that post, like we only follow people on Instagram that are posting about success that are on the same journey. You don't speak to people. Like, I, I don't know how many people you probably barely speak to from your hometown that you knew, yeah. you know, I barely speak to any of them. And it's like, I only speak to people that are on the same level, that are on the same journey, that are completely obsessed, that we can barely sleep, that we dream about it, that we, that we feed about it. But obviously it didn't start off that way. Obviously it didn't start off that way. Everything starts off juvenile. And on your journey, though, what is your reasoning for self-development? What is your reasoning for leveling up yourself and, and, and keep going? Because, you know, theoretically, the position you're in, you could just wait. You know what I mean? Yeah. If we never grew and we kept doing what we do right now, you could just wait. And you could just, you could just wait and collect multi-millions of dollars over the next five, ten years, and you'll get that residually for the, the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, you and your family will be taken care of, and that's right now. So what, what makes you, you know, continually develop yourself and, and want to keep leveling yourself up mentally, physically, financially, and spiritually? And if you could describe that feeling yeah. in words every day it's, after you enlighten yourself. It's simple. You know what I mean? And you motherfuckers have to understand this. Hypothetical is hypocritical. Yeah. Wes Watson, <laughs> Wes but that Watson. hypothetical is hypocritical. People talk about You motherfuckers better understand this. <laughs> I love Wes Watson, bro. That shit was fire. You guys, that's one of the best podcasts I've ever watched with you guys. Dude. I was, I always want to like try to imitate that, and I, I get passionate in other forms. But you know what I mean? He, that's a real ass dude, man. He, like behind camera, he was the same guy, man. And uh, that this is a good question, though. So the realization of self development and the, and the 
purity of it and the why of it is different for everybody. I, I, had, this, I had this seed planted in my mind that I, I probably owe my dad my entire my entire life to, in, in, in a way, for this one seed, is he started to indoctrinate my mind when I was a young man of becoming the greatest warrior to ever exist in, 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 in many different ways, you know what I mean? So my dad, I don't know if he loves movies as much as I do now, but he loved, I remember like we loved movies, I feel like when we were growing up and we like when I had that conscious time with him, because I only really truly remember my childhood like about like a little bit before like six-ish and, and then my mom took us back. So like really like two years, like eight to 10 when my mom was away. And I feel like there were some really special moments where I remember when he, he came and drove to Pennsylvania and took me and my, my sister back to, to the drive and like one trip like we usually do. And <laughs> um, I think the first thing we watched and some you know parents probably won't like this, you know, but I, I, I want to say the first thing we watched was like, Scarface. Scarface. You know what I mean? It was. I think it was Scarface, and but there were there was. You know, my my dad was still good about it. You know, if there was anything crazy, you know, he might cover my eyes or something like that. But it was the principle of you are a man, and you will never bow to another man. You will never accept defeat. You will gladly take death before defeat. You will look every man in his eyes, and you will let him know that you are going to win or you're gonna die trying. And we watched Rocky, and we watched 300, and we watched Gladiator, and I'm t we watched Troy, and I, Troy is the one I really locked in on. And, and we would just, it, we would almost rehearse and recite. And he had this self-belief in himself of being Achilles, the world's greatest warrior. And, and just many different times, even to this day, you know, we've reconnected right now, and he will send stuff, even to this day today, like, you know, I think uh, sending lion stuff today, like never backing down. But, but this instance with Achilles, and, you know, he would bring it up often because a lot of young men and just people in general will go through moments in life every single day. And I remember Achilles was asleep, and the armies were at war, and he was a... Almost like a, I forget the title when you hire out warriors. Um, so I believe it starts with an M or something like that, but he's asleep. And so the king, I think, believe it was Agamemnon, sends for Achilles and a young boy wakes him up in his tent. And he says, you know, they're looking for you. It's time for you to fight. Achilles is getting up. Imagine a king that fights his own battles. And he tells the boy, hand me my helmet. Hand me my helmet, hand me my shield, hand me my sword. Hands him his stuff, starts to mount his horse. And the boy looks at him and he says, man, you're fighting. He's a giant, I wouldn't want to fight him. 